Did you know that the U.S. produces 27 billion pounds of pork each year? I did not, and it's kind of horrifying. I'm more of a veggie person. <laughs> but I did know that schemes involving pig butchering are the cause of losses exceeding $75 billion globally. No, So this is uh, extraordinary. So this has been the topic of some, uh, I think they're calling it now the Electronic Fraud Task Force meetings that that I've been a part of that were open to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, pig butchering is by far one of the biggest things that the Secret Service and the FBI are, are responding to. And there was a very cool segment on the, um, I guess it's called Last Week Tonight with John yes. Oliver, right? That was about this? Yep. Yep. And so when something gets to the point where an HBO weekly news show is covering it and covering it, I, I thought, I mean, you tell me, Kelly, I thought it was done with some compassion and some, and some uh, nuance. Absolutely. I, one of the things that strikes me in these um, situations where we're talking about crime gangs and the people who are kind of on the ground level being the scammers, we, we often forget Again, like that emotional humanness, that element that's in there for most of them. And um, I really appreciated how they were able to show compassion, not only for the victims, but um, also for some of the people who are forced into this life against their will. So the basic structure that the uh, HBO program with John Oliver kind of put out is is common to the to, you know to those of us, and I think there was a long form article in Bloomberg about this too. There's been a couple of things recently in the popular press, but you know during the pandemic, some of these big casinos, at least in China and some other place places in um, in Asia, they changed their operation from being a live in person casino to online scams. Yeah. Um, what they're doing is you know they they text people, often Americans, and they develop a a rapport and a relationship. And then, and only once they've developed that rapport, you know, which turns out, you know, this starts with being a, a, an accidental text, turns into a friendship, then turns into an exploitation. Um, then that's where they cash in. So what, how is this different from like the Nigerian prince fraud? Kayla? Yeah, it's, it's almost more insidious because there's this extra element to it where the, the people being the victims of this uh, being scammed there's no direct money exchanged between them and the scammer that they're forming this relationship with. Instead, they're directed to a separate app or platform that seems very legitimate. It'll have really solid ratings. It'll be verified in the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. Um, by all accounts, it seems very legitimate. Um, and then, boom, yeah. things start to turn in a different direction. Yeah, and it's... um. The, the part of the nuance here is that these aren't all hardened intentional criminals who are on the other end of those text chats. The uh, story went into some real detail in terms of some of the folks who are doing this are forced into doing it, right? They're mm -hmm. either um, victims of human trafficking or they're folks who are lured from one country to another country with the promise of a job, a legitimate right. job. Uh, often an online job, and their password or other travel papers are um, held, and they're yeah. essentially forced to 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 do it this way. And you know they're presented with these training manuals. They're presented with these online personas that they and then adopt. And yeah. so, if you get one of these um, highly detailed text messages like "Hey, who are you?" or "Is this John from the bakery?" Yeah. Um, that's on the other end. That's a person who. Maybe a victim of trafficking, not yep. not just somebody who's there directly to steal your money. Yep. It's it's better at this point in time to just assume that someone not in your contact list sending you a random message uh, is very likely attached to one of these pig butchering operations. Um, I know sometimes it can be uh, <laughs> enticing to respond, kind of mess with someone a little bit. Uh, like in the old days of giving uh, a wrong number. Um, but because this is now the way these schemes start, it's honestly better to just tell your phone that it's junk, report it as junk and delete the number entirely. Yeah. And, you know, 
as hard as it can be to approach with compassion these things, that was one takeaway that I had had, which is instead of getting angry at the person, I get angry at the system that allows this to happen. And I know that doesn't do anything. I'm not solving any problem, but it does help me uh, think about it in a way with a little more humanity than I probably had before. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, the bad guys who are behind these schemes uh, are finding themselves more and more being tracked by law enforcement around the world and particularly in the U.S. Um, And we have with us a guest today who, for a large portion of his career, uh, was actually behind some of that intelligence gathering and even some of those arrests. Uh, So I'm your host, Jack Clabby. I'm a cybersecurity attorney at Carleton Fields. And with me is Kaylee Melton. Kaylee's the vice president of U.S. remote publishing teams at Know Before. After a short break, we'll chat with Roman Sanikov. Roman is the president of Constellation Cyber. That's a boutique consulting firm, and they specialize in cyber threat intelligence. In addition to his cybersecurity work, Roman also serves as the secretary and the vice president of Helpster USA. That's a nonprofit dedicated to global healthcare access. We'll ask him about this and more when we return. Welcome to No Password Required, a monthly conversation that introduces you to some of the top talent in the world of cybersecurity. All right, so welcome back. Our guest today is Roman Sanikov. Roman, welcome to No Password Required. Thank you. It's an honor. So, Roman, I want to uh, start with your current role, learn about that, and then we'll go back. And I want to find out more about your career path and how you got to today. So what can you tell us about your role and what you do at Constellation Cyber? Sure. So uh, without sounding too promotional about it, uh, Constellation Cyber is just basically my project. It's a consulting opportunity for me to work with companies, um, kind of both consuming threat intelligence on the client side, helping them use threat intelligence more uh, productively uh, and at the same time working with some companies that have information and data that they collect as part of their overall um, work and helping them turn that into uh, an intelligence product uh, and both improve their other product and also create this opportunity to share intelligence that could hopefully um, help with security in our kind of in our environment in general. Um, so that's that's an overall uh, kind of uh, uh, and the reason this is going to be a little corny, but the reason I call the constellation is because over the years I got to meet a lot of really interesting people and really smart people, and one of the things that I really enjoy is kind of bringing these stars, so to speak, together. Um, um, and uh, really kind of connecting uh, both uh, individual contributors and opportunities. Um, so that was one of the things I've always enjoyed. Um, in terms of more specific things that I'm working on right now, um, primarily, um, so there's this thing out there that, that your listeners may have heard of. It's called ransomware. Um, <laughs> and it's not a very good thing. Uh, and there's a lot of really great people out there, both in the public sector and the private sector, that are trying to combat it. But one of the things that I've been really focused on for a while, um, really since the extortion sites came out, is really trying to bring that information okay. um, to the world because uh, – how do I put this without making anybody too upset? But a lot of times when an incident happens, the disclosure is not great. Um, so unless it's PII, generally speaking, the victim organization is kind of told to just say that there was an incident, they're investigating it, they're dealing with it, they're handling it, but there's very little um, that is really you know, useful that comes out of it. And, uh, you know, we've seen that, for example, with the major healthcare breach that just happened, uh, where there was a lot of speculation uh, in the community, in law enforcement, you know, what exactly happened? Did they pay? Did they not pay? You know, what exactly? And it's not super helpful, uh, I think, to prevent the longer, wider spread of uh, the negative impact. Obviously, I understand why the company might not want to disclose it. But that damages, so to speak, other entities that are associated with it. So one of the things I'm doing right now is helping 
secondary and tertiary victims. Um, so maybe not the company that got ransomed, yeah. but the companies or the uh, affiliates that whose information was impacted by the leak. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of times, unfortunately, they don't know um, what is out there. And huh. uh, because, you know, either for technical reasons, it's not very easy to download things yeah. off of Tor and analyze it. A lot of times the stuff isn't uh, collected in the most uh, easy to analyze manner. Uh, but that's one of my main projects right now, again, is kind oh, of wow. processing some of that data and giving the opportunity to these other entities to really uh, prepare and, and mitigate uh, against uh, future attacks and, and losses. Yeah, that's great because that's the hub and spoke of a ransomware attack mm -hmm. is that it's not just the data of the entity that got hit, but more and more frequently, it radiates out to corporate customers of that entity and then corporate customers of those corporate customers. Exactly. So you're already two steps away and then finally consumers yep. who, did, who, may, who may have known or may not have known that their mm -hmm. data was being held by like substrates of and layers mm -hmm. of, uh, of other companies that were all making promises to one another as to the care of that data. And we've seen that happen. We've seen it specifically with, um, again, not get going into specific examples, but companies that, you know, there was a company that reached out to me a while back saying, hey, we're getting hit with all of this really sophisticated phishing and spear phishing all of a sudden. You know, what's going on? We're, you know, our solutions are having a hard time keeping up with it. Um, and so we had a conversation and I asked them, you know, uh, were any of your affiliates recently ransomed? Uh, and and they said no, but an affiliate or, or yeah. some some uh, part of an affiliate was ransomed. So kind of two steps removed. Yeah. Um, and so I said, well, you know, there's a good chance that this may be part of the reason that you're getting hit with this sophisticated because they know all of this communication. They basically consider it all of the stuff leaked, read, yeah. processed by, by the bad guys. And uh, sure enough, about six months later, they got hit with, um, uh, I believe it was by the same crew oh. that hit the uh, so the the company that was kind of two steps removed. So um, either they didn't follow my device very <laughs> carefully uh, or maybe it was just, uh, again, maybe they didn't quite give it as much attention because I basically said that they had to change their security posture vis-a-vis -vis those entities uh, radically, um, you know, uh, implement all sorts of multi-factor authentication, all that kind of stuff because, yeah, and so again, that's what I'm kind of trying to do is to help companies understand um, when they've been impacted uh, by an incident at a different, um, you know, supply chain or client, et cetera. So that's, I mean, so going back to the name Constellation Cyber, I, li I like that because there is that thought that in the intelligence community, we've got to protect, we've got to jealously guard and protect our walls and, and what we get. And you're thinking about it from a different perspective, which is you're bringing this network together to help your clients and to help the, right, you're, you're using, you're putting the walls down and you're and making it more lateral than vertical, which, I, which makes a lot of sense. Because I think ultimately the only way we can, um, make a dent in this. I mean, you know, you've seen, for example, the industry has grown by leaps and bounds. You know, you go to RSA, you go to Black Hat, you get trillion dollar, you get these all. At the same time, the problem hasn't gone away. Yeah. Um, so somehow there's a lot more money. There's a lot more really awesome tools out there. And so you would think that things would be getting better, but in a lot of ways, I don't think they have. Yeah. Um, and so I think the only way we can really make some sort of a difference is if we do have this kind of more collaborative approach a more transparent approach and not about kind of CYA, uh, <laughs> but really about yeah. protecting, you know, the then the whole environment so to be good at this you have to know what you're looking for uh know how to look for it and you know have contacts and people you can you can call on to help you know it, this must have taken a lot of effort to build so maybe you can kind of roman walk us through your career sort of like how did you first get into this and then kind of take us through what what took you to here 
Yeah, it, it, uh, I kind of backed into this career, to be honest with you. Um, I started out as an interpreter. Um, I worked for about 25 years as an interpreter and translator, uh, doing a lot of really fun stuff. But one of my primary clients for about 21 years of, of that time was the Federal Bureau of Investigation um, and Department of Justice, a couple of other, but primarily the, the FBI. Um, and uh, about a third of my time way th- Kind of through my 21 year stint, um, I got uh, called into a um, uh, cyber investigation. And it was uh, not technically my first one, but the first one where I was really embedded in the investigation. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons was because, kind of in the 90s and the 2000s, you really had the explosion of Russian speaking, not necessarily yeah. Russian geographically, but Russian speaking individuals uh, and these various forums and platforms. Um, and I was – at that time, I was, I believe, the youngest uh, and the most computer savvy, which is kind of sad, um, <laughs> translator at the at the FBI. I think a lot of the people there were not very comfortable with computers at all, okay. uh, at least in the, in the translator space. Uh, a lot of work was still being done kind of uh, on – on typewriter, believe it or not, awesome. um, and uh, so um, it's a more secure. It's in. a it's a more secure way of writing things down. To be fair, it is. It is actually yes. <laughs> but uh, so that was how I wound up getting into uh, cyber, and then I realized that this was actually really cool because you got to be really embedded in this. And the, my first investigation was. Um, um, Related to the Bloomberg LLP um, and a hack of um, of that organization, uh, wow. it was really pretty ingenious, and it was done by a Russian-speaking individual in the country of Kazakhstan. Um, and so I actually got to travel to Kazakhstan a couple of times wow. to help the prosecutors and the agents collect information from our Kazakh uh, counterparts, and also got to work with Kazakh investigators as they came over to the United States um, and. And uh, uh, help brought evidence uh, to help uh, the prosecution of this uh, uh, individual in the United States. So it was wow. really fun. Roman, just as an aside, we've talked on the program before about the U.S. legal attaches who are resident in foreign countries. Did you get to meet yeah. and hang out with some of them? And are they as cool as we've heard? I did. Um, and I actually, I take credit. I, I won't name the individual, but I actually take credit for at least one later becoming an, an ALAT oh, uh, nice. because uh, they enjoyed the trip. I, I'm a kind of a, just a natural born tour guide. So wherever <laughs> I go, I wind up like taking people around. And even if it's not necessarily a place that I've been to before, I just read <laughs> up so much that I'm like, OK, we got to check this out. And he had such a good time that he subsequently went and became kind of a career uh, legal attache at various uh, <laughs> Russian-speaking uh, uh, cities and, uh, and countries. Uh, so it was, uh, I was very proud of that. <laughs> I imagine being a Russian-speaking attache is a pretty intense job. <laughs> These days, yeah, I think it was a little bit more chill back then. Uh, you know, I think was, uh, we were on friendlier terms. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I'm sure now it's a little bit, uh, a little bit tricky, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> so, at, at Constellation, you're promoting now a more holistic approach to cybersecurity. Can you elaborate a little bit on that and and how this holistic approach, you know, contrasts with kind of what we were talking about—the siloed approach that some folks sure. still take. You know, I don't have a product, so to speak, so I'm not pushing a specific um, solution to things. Uh, I really believe that a lot of it has to do with education and a lot of it has to do with education, both of the um, company hierarchy, of company employees, of consumers and and, um, uh, and customers. Uh, the way I look at it, and I, you know, People who know me probably have gotten tired of me using this analogy, but if you're an employee of a shop in a, in a mall or something like that, at the end of the day, you'll probably count 
the money in the cash register. You maybe you'll put it away in the safe. You'll lock up. You'll put set the alarm. You'll maybe pull you know lock the doors. All that kind of stuff. None of that is because you are a part of the security team. Um, yeah. Overtly, you're not part of the security team. But it's something that has intrinsically been trained in us as part of you know being an employee. These basic levels of security. Yeah. Uh, maybe checking the fifty dollar bill that you get. Um, so these things, and nobody really pushes back against that. You know, the, that's part of being an employee is going through these this kind of basic hygiene. But when it comes to cybersecurity, um, it's there's like this kind of ethos that it's somehow the responsibility of these kind of, you know, I'll, I'll make fun of myself here, but like these troglodytes that sit in <laughs> the server closet somewhere, uh, you know, never see the light of day uh, and that they're the ones that are responsible for the security. And meanwhile, we, um, you know, it, as users, uh, you know, we don't know what to do. We don't know yeah. how to, what decisions to make, et cetera. So I really think that until um, everybody, um, and that's kind of why I think about why I think of holistically, until it becomes everyone's responsibility. So whether it's through training, through incentives, through maybe in some cases punitive measures. I mean, yeah. you don't want to hot fire people, but at the same time, you do want to have a level of responsibility if somebody does something really yeah. stupid. Um, so I think there has to be uh, the situation. And conversely, and that's kind of like when I think on the consumer side, the people who are not experts. Conversely, I think we as people who are in the industry, I think we have to be more open to educating, more okay. open to, um, I don't want to say dumbing things down, but making things accessible uh, of what we do, why we do, how we do it. Um, I recently uh, posted some stuff about pig butchering, you know, or yeah. fraud in general. Um, um, and, uh, you know, some people, unfortunately, kind of still said, listen, there's been so much written about this that if somebody is still gets hit with this, then it's kind of like their own stupidity. And this is the same stuff that I heard literally 20 plus years ago when we were working with, yeah. you know, it was an interesting case when we were working with Russia where they were trying to get, they had identified some individuals who were involved in romance scams yeah. in Russia and they were trying to get people people in the West, law enforcement, to um, file complaints. And I remember talking to people in Texas and a couple <laughs> of other places, law enforcement, and they were like, hey, so these guys sent, you know, I'm not going to do my Texas draw here. Um, <laughs> I don't want to offend anyone. But, you know, these guys sent $4,000 to some Natasha in Russia. Uh, you know, that's, that, that's you know, that'll be the lesson uh, for them. So they should, they should be grateful <laughs> that it wasn't more. And that was well, the they, attitude. <laughs> But that's the problem. It's like we all know how to drive cars, but car accidents still happen. It's right. Mm -hmm. You're going to mm -hmm. still the reason it works is because of innate human nature and you can decrease the amount of it. But yep. getting it to zero or blaming victims. And mm -hmm. we also know, Roman, like we know what blaming victims does. Mm -hmm. Blaming victims just drives it down deeper and burrows exactly. them further and makes it harder for us to identify and find people who are willing to to speak out about it. That's exactly. that's what we, we know what happens. Yeah. So essentially, that's kind of what my approach yeah, is to the cool. holistic is really kind of hopefully foster um, collaboration and communication within our industry and not be so protective of what we found and what we, uh, you know, again, in, in threat intelligence, I can say, you know, we're guilty of this a lot of times. It's, it's all about we have the access, you know, yeah. we're the ones that know about this thing. Um, and uh, a lot of times... Everybody has similar access, you know, so it's kind of like the race to be first to say something, not always the, you know, to be right. Um, but again, kind of the, the idea of collaborating um, because we talk a lot about fighting the same fight, but we don't always kind of walk that walk. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's interesting to me where the line gets drawn between being competitive and withholding versus being collaborative and open. 
It's tricky. Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a millionaire. I haven't, uh, you know, built one of these companies that's gone, you know, uh, through the roof. Uh, so I'm not going to criticize uh, individuals. Obviously, they know uh, more than I do. But in terms of if we want to make a difference for, um, again, for the industry and in the fight against uh, um, cyber threats, yeah. I think we have to improve um, our level of uh, collaboration. So, Roman, uh, many people work their way through college taking side jobs like serving ice cream or landscaping. You had a little bit of a different path there where you were doing contract work for the FBI. How did you balance being a student with these uh, – I don't want to say clandestine, but other other pursuits that were non traditional. It, it was it was tricky. Um, well, one of the first times when I, when I first realized that it was going to be tricky was uh, towards the end of my security clearance. Uh, they had basically made it implied that I was pretty much done. I just have to come in for an interview, and I was so excited because, again, as a college student, um, I'm like, "Hey, I'm getting my first real job, and it's not you know flipping burgers and yeah. things like that." Uh, and uh, I also, you know, I was like proud of the fact that you know the FBI. I was uh, uh, was bring me on, so I told all my friends, even some people who weren't my friends, you know, that I was going to be working for the for the FBI as a contractor. And then I show up at the interview, and I go through everything. At the end, the the gentleman says, um, "Okay, so by the way, you're not to tell anyone that you're working with the FBI." And I'm like, <laughs> Wow. Somebody could have mentioned that a little bit earlier because oh I God. think like everyone and their mother pretty much knows that I'm going to be working with the FBI. Awesome. And so he gets this this very pain look on his face and he says, OK, well, tell them that you are um, you're going to be doing a clerical position. Don't tell them that you're going to be in. It. And so I'm like. OK, so I'm dropping out of college, you know, where I'm doing fairly well yeah. um, to take a clerical position with the FBI. That's not going to sound suspicious at all. You're just so, very passionate uh, and aspirational. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I love my country so much that I want to, you know, just drop my, my – yeah. So uh, – but that was that was the beginning where I realized that it was going to be a little tricky. Um, I had some really interesting uh, reinvestigations. In the in the bureau, you get these like five, ten year. Theoretically, it's supposed to be five. Sometimes it's a little longer. Reinvestigations to make sure you haven't become a security risk. Um, and uh, you know, some of the people that they send out to interview your friends and colleagues and all that are not the most subtle people in the world. <laughs> and so, um, you know, one of my friends uh, from from a college friend uh, called me in a panic saying that, uh, you know, he was afraid that he just like ruined my career because they asked him if I if I did drugs. And uh, he said no, but he is kind of fond of vodka. Um, and so uh, the the agent, he happened to live in, uh, in Utah. He moved to Salt Lake City. Okay. And he said, I think the agent like really freaked out. I think <laughs> she took this really seriously that I was a uh, – that, that you, he's speaking to me, yeah. uh, are having an alcohol problem. And and so I, I calmed him down. I said that a lot of times these are just like new agents that are doing this stuff. So I think I'm going to be okay. Uh, but uh, okay. there was there was some fun fun times. <laughs> yeah. But w one of the other if, – if I have a second, w one of the other fun incidents was um, when – I the first birthday that I spent with my um, the young lady who is now my wife um, was it was her birthday. I was stuck in the back of a van in the middle of summer in Brooklyn doing oh. surveillance um, of a meet with a um, someone who was collaborating with us after having been arrested and was meeting with some Russian gangsters at a at a diner in, in Brooklyn, and they wanted to make sure because. I guess there was, a, there was a bounty out on this guy's head. They wanted to make sure that nothing horrible was going to happen. Oh, so the problem is that it's it's Brooklyn. It's the middle of summer. Um, and uh, all the agents, uh, this was a joint FBI, IRS. They're all sitting in comfortable vehicles several blocks away in air conditioning. I have to sit right next to this diner because um, the back then the technology was a little bit more limited. So the yeah. range was a little bit more 
limited. Um, and the van has to be off. And it oh has to be God. sealed completely. So oh this IRS van, the, what they do is they put ice in it and they turn the fans on. No the way. Battery. So no at least way. there's like some circulation in there. Unfortunately, nobody for, nobody remembered to bring the ice. Oh, so no. when I actually showed up at my wife's birthday, you know, kind of like celebration, <laughs> I don't think there was a dry spot on my body. Oh, because so it was I, I literally looked like I had just gone through the rinse cycle uh, and uh, but the person was not killed or harmed so Good. in the end uh, my, my job was was done well that's incredible Robin <laughs> that's awesome we, we also understand that one of your adventures with the FBI was that at one point you became or were the moderator on a major Russian language underground forum how did that come about yeah, so that was an interesting case. Um, and it's actually one of the things that's a little tough. People don't really think about it too much. But when you're taking on somebody's persona and when you're on these places, um, you are doing undercover type of work. So um, even though you're, you're working with agents and stuff, but really it's you who's who's interacting with, with the bad guys. And obviously I wasn't Serpico. I wasn't in mortal danger and things yeah. like that. And uh, for, for those in the audience who, who know who Serpico was, that was a little bit <laughs> before most people's time, but still. Um, but, you know, you do have to ingratiate yourself to people. You have to kind of seem authentic. You have to build um, relationships with people, knowing that you're working against them. So for most people, it is difficult. And I've yeah. been the boss of a lot of people in, later on in life in managerial positions. And a lot of times people find it difficult. You know, uh, a lot of people in the industry, they're kind of the, they're lurkers. You know, they, they monitor what's happening. But to really get information, you have to be able to interact with people. You have to be able to, you know, kind of conduct deals. Yeah. And a lot of times those deals aren't going to happen. Because they're illegal and, you know, you're going to be kind of pulling the plug at a certain point. Um, but it's it's tough. Um, it's, uh, you know, unless you're kind of really good or pathological, um, then it, it's tough. Uh, even though, you know, these people are doing something wrong. And in yes. some cases, they are really bad people. Not always, but in some cases. But it's still difficult, I think, for most people to kind of build a close working relationship with somebody knowing that you're trying to get them uh, in trouble and stuff like that. So, you know, we see a lot of these movies um, and we don't really think about that, but it is kind of tough. Yeah. So what was the transition like for you as you took over that account? Well, the gentleman was arrested. Um, he wasn't super happy, but <laughs> we kind of um, uh, convinced him uh, to uh, collaborate. Um, and uh, I, I won't go into all the details of the collaborate the process, but there was some issues because there were several different agencies involved in the arrest, yeah. okay. and the agencies weren't always on the same page about what was going to happen. So a lot of times I kind of had to smooth over some. Some of the bumps in the road um, that uh, that people were kind of going through when they were making the decision, uh, are we going to say, you know, excuse my language, F you to the government or are we going to say, uh, you know, OK, uh, we're we're going to collaborate and uh, and try to uh, get ourselves a 5K uh, letter. Um, and uh, um, it, but eventually, again, the person wasn't thrilled about it. But what would happen is they would bring him out of prison on a regular basis. We would sit there together for several months and I would kind of shoulder surf him. And then after a while, I would do the interaction and he would shoulder surf me um, and make uh, kind of comments about what I was doing, what I was doing right, what I was doing wrong. Um, over time, you know, I think that my persona evolved a little bit differently from what his had been just because that's – but I did it gradually enough that I don't think anyone – I just say, as far as I know, I didn't lose – 
I think, well, I shouldn't say that. We did lose one individual, but that wasn't my fault. That was because of some operational decisions that were made by uh, by the Bureau. I think they kind of pushed things a little bit too, too quickly. Um, but overall, I was able to maintain that persona for, um, man, something like eight years. Um, and uh, it was... Uh, it was also, again, stressful because agents come and go, but you maintain that um, continuity. New agents yeah. come in. You explain to them, you know, what this is, what the different accesses you have are, what the benefits, what the drawbacks is. And also, you can't exactly maintain bankers' hours um, <laughs> if you're, you know, posing as, as a criminal. Um, so there was a lot of weekends. Again, my wife was very understanding. A lot of late nights uh, that I, uh, I had to spend on on various forms, uh, you know, dealing with people's uh, bad behavior and, and kicking people out and uh, giving them warnings and, and stuff like that. What constitutes bad behavior on something on a forum like this? You know, it's really funny. For some reason, Russian language forums, they have this thing about cursing. So even oh, though wow. there's a lot of cursing, but at the same time, at some point, a moderator or an admin or somebody will just like just go off and we'll just start like giving <laughs> – bans and stuff for people wow. using, you know, uh, questionable lexical choices and, and stuff like that. So, um, but normally um, there were things, one of the things you really have to look out for is uh, clone accounts. You know, I could probably talk about this for hours, but the whole point behind forums is you need a place where inherently untrustworthy individuals can find, who don't know each other can figure out a way to work together and to trust each other. Mm -hmm. And the way they can do that is by reputation, by not ripping people off and stuff like that. Now, if you create multiple accounts on a forum, then you can start vouching for yourself under those accounts. So that was one of the things that was the trickiest is um, try to identify individuals who were, um, you know, somehow not what they appeared and maybe controlling multiple accounts and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, there, there are, obviously there are a lot of people who do, you know, exit scams or rip other people off or maybe have some sort of dispute. Obviously you see that a lot with legitimate business as well, having disputes. So that's the kind of stuff that, um, uh, that I have to deal with as well. <laughs> Roman kind of given your experience and your clearances, you know, you must have translated for a lot of global leaders over the years. You know, what do you allow yourself to learn from those moments? What's that like? Yeah, uh, I, you know, a lot of times I kind of felt like, um, Zelig or, or Forrest Gump or something, you know, in, in your head, you're still a little kid, uh, you know, and, and you're like, wow, how am I standing next to, you know, I got to interpret for Eric Holder for a little bit, who oh, was wow. just – just the sweetest person, one of the sweetest people I'd met. He, um, we were walking through the Hermitage and I was part of his security detail. And all of a sudden, a bunch of older Japanese people kind of ran up to him and were like, Oh my God, you're, and the, the Russian security detail and the American were kind of like trying to usher him along. And he's like, No, no, no. You know, he's, he's shaking hands with all these people. Um, and, uh, um, so that was, those were really interesting. I think those are some of the takeaways is to like not lose your humanity yeah. in the midst of, of all of this. Um, and I think the people who are most successful are the ones who don't forget that there's people out there that depend on what we do. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the big lessons that I, uh, that I took away from, from um, some of the people that I really admired. The, some of the things that, g given what you were doing, I imagine that a lot of the investigations ended up not going to an arrest because it maybe got taken care of on another part of the government over there, but that some did end with arrests, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty cool given the kind of crime that you all were investigating, that you were able to prosecute folks. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about a memorable arrest maybe that, that you were a part of? 
Sure. Um, actually, one of the more memorable arrests um, was the individual, um, and hopefully he won't be mad at me for, for talking about this, but uh, we're actually um, friends. It's been many years, and he's kind of done his time. But he was the um, founder of uh, Gozi, uh, which was one of the first Trojans that used the um, rental model. Um, so before that, a lot of Trojans were sold. Um, um, and so that allowed um, law enforcement and, and researchers to uh, decompile it, to analyze it, and things like that. So this was one of those situations where he figured out that, hey, I'm just going to rent it. And I'm just going to you know, target it. Um, and so um, he was quite successful, and he had like limited clients. But um, he, was, he was a really interesting guy, um, and he was uh, – uh, had an interesting background, really smart, uh, quite young, started several companies, including several legitimate companies, yeah. and was actually in the U.S. for a legitimate project that he was doing and was in California, in the Bay Area, uh, for something or, for organized by Google, I believe. It was many years ago, but I believe that's what it was. Um, and we arrested him um, kind of uh, in the middle of uh, him. I think he was online at the time. Um, it was uh, like 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Um, and obviously he wasn't happy, but he was considered such a big um, get that we actually got the director's jet. The director of the FBI jet came out, picked him up, picked us up and flew us back to New York from California. Um, and the agents were like, so this was actually, I believe, my, my second time in the director's jet. I did have another you know, <laughs> flight in there. But um, the, the first time was with the director, so that was even more fun. That's incredible. But um, this time, uh, and I remember the agents were like, wow, this is so cool. We're flying in the director's jet. Uh, and he was like, he's so grim. This, he was a young man, I think like 23 at the time. He's like, the fact that they sent out this jet to pick me up – means that this is going to be bad for me. This mm -hmm. is that they spent yeah. so much time and effort mm -hmm. on this. This is this is not going to be something that's going to be a slap on the wrist. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, he did work with us for, for a few years and then he did spend some time in, in prison. Uh, and then he's been released and he's living overseas now. And, you know, uh, I'm happy to say that he's actually a productive member of society, has put all of that behind him mm -hmm. and is quite successful, has a has a family and and has um, he actually has uh, helped um, some individuals around the the, the war in, in Ukraine. So I'm, I'm very happy that and. I, I think maybe this is kind of megalomaniacal on my part, but I think that I took a, take a little bit of the credit in him turning his life around. I remember I was one of the I think the only person that would go visit him in, in prison afterwards, um, and it's actually after I left the bureau and, and he was there, uh, but he really appreciated that um, and that I hadn't kind of given up on him. Um, and he was such a smart person. And so I even like wrote a letter to the judge saying, look, you know, it would be a loss to lock somebody up like this for a long yeah. time because he can do. And like I said, uh, he has done some, some positive things uh, since he's uh, – so I'm you know, happy that I was part of that. Yeah, that's something that with so much of what we talk about in this community around sophisticated online crime is that the same skills that make someone good at that, responsiveness, diligence, group organization – or the same things that make a person successful in traditional legal businesses. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. But for a step here or a step there, someone could be there. And it's good to think that even if you take a step to the left as opposed to a step to the right, you can still get back on the path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not yeah. – naive enough to say that all of these people just yeah. are in this situation because mm -hmm. they come from poverty and come from, you know, um, horrible backgrounds. Uh, that's that's not the case. I mean, there are some people that I interacted with who just were not pleasant people. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> no but there were um, uh, the majority of the people that I interacted with um, kind of, uh, you know, made a mistake, but they weren't unredeemable. Um, yeah, okay. I think uh, a lot of the people, um, after they did their time, um, or some people, you know, 
did other things uh, to um, kind of fix the situation. Um, but a lot of them subsequently became uh, really successful in the industry. So fighting further, you know, cyber attacks and cyber crime um, and uh, or outside of the industry as uh, this young man uh, kind of stepped away from it completely, doing a lot of other things. Uh, but um, and, and I think that's one of the things that I think sometimes is, is a little, you know, going back to the question of holistic um, is we don't always – talk about the human beings behind these attacks. Um, and a lot of times there's like this idea of, you know, like lock them up and throw away the key yeah. um, and all that stuff. And I actually think that, you know, sometimes you may need to do that, but I don't think that should be the first uh, response uh, to this. Um, and I think also just understanding why people do things to really, I, I think probably – you know, this is one of those things that Machiavelli or Tsing Tu yeah. or someone said this, that, you know, you really need to understand your, your enemy and get into their head uh, to uh, to be able to counter them. Yeah. And Roman, on, on this point, we're going to take a break in a quick moment, but we do want to ask you about Helpster USA. Can you tell us about that and, and about your role with, with Helpster? Sure. So this is actually um, – this goes back to uh, Nikita, who is the, the young man who I uh, uh, arrested in California about 15 years ago or so. Uh, but uh, he's a successful businessman now, and he actually uh, helped uh, found or helped uh, sponsor this organization. It's an organization that is dedicated to providing life um, – life-saving or life-altering treatment to uh, young – it's primarily people, I believe, under 21 okay. uh, all over the world, primarily in developing economies. So um, they have offices in Nigeria, Kenya, uh, Cambodia. And really what it focuses on is that there's a lot of kids who are literally dying because they – they or their parents can't afford surgery that's three, four, five hundred dollars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is thing that's mind blowing. And yeah. when he told me about this, uh, it was really something that they, they needed someone who could be um, part of their um, board in the United States. And so I jumped on that opportunity uh, because, you know, it, it just boggles the mind that we live in an environment where you can save a life literally, yeah. not, you know, over time, but right now you can save a life by donating, uh, you know, uh, or collecting three, four hundred dollars uh, in in some of these countries. And so that's what helps the does is they um, they identify cases, uh, they vet to make sure that the money is going to the hospital uh, and is doing for the surgery um, and they provide supportive um, and uh, the other thing is, you know, not to get too political, but a lot of the people who are working there are people from who have kind of escaped Russia. Okay. And so with um, being from Russia um, and seeing a lot of the horrible things that are associated with Russia right now, justifiably so, it's really helps me morally uh, and, and emotionally that there are Russians out there who are um, dedicating themselves to really helping people and making um, positive change in, in the world. That's great. That's beautiful. Thank you, Roman. We're going to take a short break now. And when we return, the Lifestyle Polygraph. Stay with us. You're listening to the No Password Required Podcast. We cover cybersecurity and a lot of other stuff. Welcome back. As many of you know, the Lifestyle Polygraph is a test used by the federal government to determine if a person is worthy of learning some of our nation's most important secrets. Here, we use this technique for slightly lower stakes to determine whether our guest can join our fantasy cybersecurity squad. Roman, are you ready for our Lifestyle Polygraph? I hope so. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Uh, All right. Number one. During your career, you've done some translating work for NHL hockey teams, and many rumors call out NHL players as being some of the most eccentric in the sports world. Do you have any firsthand evidence that could confirm these rumors for us? No, 
I can't say they're the most eccentric because I haven't met a lot of people from other sports. I can say that they're it's interesting because they're both very down to earth in a lot of ways, but at the same time they are very quirky, uh, particularly goalies. Um, my son is actually a goalie; he plays at a fairly fairly high level. They are a breed apart, um, <laughs> and they will frequently talk to the goalposts around them. You know, really? thank them for. Or, uh, you know, for when the puck, uh, when they miss the puck, but it goes off the post. Uh, so you'll literally, you'll see them standing there in net and have any conversation. Uh, you know, my, my son, when they play music between uh, stoppages, sometimes without being conscious, he's there dancing, you know, <laughs> to some, some heavy metal uh, and stuff like that. And uh, it's just, uh, so they, they are, you know, very different. Um, so I, I would say that. They're, I don't know if they're the most eccentric, but they're definitely up there. We have a, uh, a Russian goalkeeper in the, in Tampa, Florida, Andre yes. Vasilevsky, who is yep. exactly that character. He's <laughs> six foot 11, yep. butterflies himself, and he mm. just – everyone loves him so much with all their heart. And, you know, I don't want to know what he's like in real life because I just had this <laughs> – we all have this image of him as just being the most wondrous guy, but um, – Around the time when they won the cup, I mean, he, when he was walking around, he had like a little kid and it was just such a wonderful, wholesome thing. So, but he does this thing with his eyes where he backs up and he does that. He has his eccentric moments. So we're happy to have our, have our local eccentric, cool guy <laughs> between the pipes. I understand that, that burden, I'm a bassist. So we're also stereotypically <laughs> yes. eccentric. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. <laughs> If All there's right. leftover food, don't worry, the basis will finish it. <laughs> exactly. Is that kind of a comment? Like exactly. stuff like that. I don't know. Katie will get it later. We'll just, yeah, that's fine. We'll I'll take, take care of it. <laughs> All right. So earlier you described yourself as kind of like a Forrest Gump style character. Can you give us an example of your life being like a, the proverbial box of chocolates? Boy, um, there's been so many instances where something unexpected has happened. Um, you know, I've um, come across people who I never expected to come across in, in various uh, in environments, both for, for better or for worse. Um, one time I was coming back from a, this was when I was with the FBI, I was coming back from a side gig. I used to joke with the FBI saying that the only way I could afford to work for the FBI and live in New York was by taking a lot of side gigs uh, and stuff like that. So I was there. It was February. I think it was around 1999, and I was dressed in, in my finest suit coming back from a law office where I was interpreting for a legal deposition. Uh, and I, uh, my um, boss pulls me in and says, hey, there's an incident that happened on the high seas. There's a ship coming in, and I think there was – there was there, they think that there was a murder. Uh, oh, my and God. Would you – be willing to go check this out because it's a Ukrainian ship and they all speak Russian on the ship. Uh, and he, well, this may sound a little sexist, but he was like most of the uh, other translators at the time there were, were female and were older. And he's like, I would feel more comfortable if you had to go meet with these people for you to do it. And so I'm like, sure, I've never been been aboard a cargo ship and you know why not and so we, we sat there until the the um uh, man it, it, it was like two or three in the morning because it took forever for this thing to come in and it was sleeting and it was february oh, and the man. ship wound up being um stopping uh, it was a big, big cargo ship under the verrazano bridge so it's out there in the bay um <laughs> and we take a little nypd boat out to this ship and they're arguing about should we go up should we not go up because people don't want to climb up this in the middle of the night with like hail coming down fair and, enough you know and then some of the you know some of the agents having their like combat gear and they're like you know we don't really want to climb four stories in this but at some point they're like well you know i think one of the 
NYPD guys said, look, if there's a dead body up there, my captain is going to have my hide if I don't at least see what's going on. Uh, and they're arguing about who's going to go up. And so finally, and this wasn't because of bravery or anything, but it was just I was starting to get a little kind of annoyed. I'm like, look, guys, whoever goes up, I have to go up because <laughs> without me, nothing's going to happen. And so I volunteered to go up first. And um, I go up to this rope ladder about four stories up and uh the uh the guy on the nypd boat says okay so you climb up about 10 steps you loop your hands around it so you're not climbing with your hands facing forward you're climbing with your hands kind of facing towards you um and then you go up about 10 steps and they have to like pull the ladder away because it was frozen to the 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 ship and he goes we're gonna back up away from you and i'm like whoa what do you mean you're gonna back up away from me there's water underneath me. And he goes, well, if you slip and fall in the water, we'll fish you out. If you slip and fall on the boat, chances are you'll break your back. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I still don't feel comfortable with this, but at least <laughs> oh I understand the, the rationale behind it. Um, and so I climb up to the top finally, and this kind of wizened old face shows up and weather beaten. Uh, and he looks at me and he's like, he doesn't know what to say because he doesn't speak English. And so I say, you know, my politest, you know, Russian, I'm like, uh, good evening, you know pleasure i'm your interpreter how can i help and so just the 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 you know his face lit up and just like everybody gathered around me they pulled me over and it was a really um so you know I, obviously it was a sad incident the, the captain yeah. of the ship uh, committed suicide he wasn't killed but he committed suicide because um the ship had been um traveling for a very long time for some like six months uh and they weren't used to these long usually they only sailed in the black sea for a couple of months uh but and they weren't getting paid the owner of the ship was kind of stalling with a payment and so it was a very stressful um situation so he finally he committed suicide um yeah. and uh, so obviously it's sad but it was such an interesting experience that i certainly had no idea i was going to be when i'm like that i was going to be climbing in my suit and and expensive expensive shoes um uh when i when i left uh, my house that morning so yeah that That's was awesome. definitely one of those one of those interesting <laughs> chocolates yeah perfect anecdote i mean that that deserves to be a movie all in itself <laughs> i mean from the start to the finish is like there's been a murder <laughs> yes <laughs> awesome okay next question can you tell us what it means to be an avid mushroomer? And could you share the highlights of a satisfying day spent exploring and collecting mushrooms? Yes. So that's actually one of my one of my big hobbies. Uh, it's a great way to spend time outdoors. Um, whenever I used to say that I was a mushroomer, everybody, uh, you know, People can't see me. For those who haven't seen the picture, um, I, I could pass for an old-time hippie. Uh, and so people used to always assume that when I talked about mushrooms, uh, I talked about the magic mushrooms. Um, yeah. Sadly, I've never actually found any magic mushrooms. So I guess I'm not looking in the right uh, cow patties. Uh, but I, growing up in, in Ukraine and in Russia, uh, it was one of those things that my parents used to take me out a lot. Um, and it's really fun because you're walking around, you're looking, and all of a sudden you find this little gem. Um, and uh, I I can't say that I know all mushrooms, but I've never been poisoned. Um, and I know the ones that we collect. Um, and it, it's just anytime you find mushrooms in quantity, it's pretty satisfying. Um, as a, I just – this, I mentioned my son. He's actually uh, taking a gap year living in Finland uh, this year, playing some hockey over there. But uh, in the fall, we went on a trip with him to a, a town, and I just slammed on the brakes in the middle of this, like, county highway and i'm like oh my god those are mushrooms and i pulled <laughs> over and i backed up and these mushrooms were huge i mean they some of the mushrooms i have pictures they were literally like the hat was about a foot across wow. and they're great because they hadn't the slugs hadn't gotten to them none of the little things got to them and they were really good and so the rest of my visit i spent drying these mushrooms because uh, i couldn't eat all of them at, at once <laughs> so i wanted them drying 
buying them for for future consumption. But that was a really fun time. And even cool. even my son, who's not a huge mushroom fan, but he uh, he had a good time uh, pointing out uh, the various mushrooms. So it was a very satisfying uh, experience. That's so cool. Yeah, it really is kind of magical when you stumble up on one yep. and you've been searching for a while. <laughs> All right. Next question. The best days at work always include blank. Ooh, um, the best days of work. Um, I mean, whenever you have a client, a customer, whatever it may be, there, that has a bit of a kind of a eureka moment and saying like, wow, this really like help me figure something out, help me understand something that is – I, I don't want to sound like I'm some sort of like holier than thou individual, but whenever you hear, because I'm in the service industry, like I'm helping people. That's the way I look at it. Um, and whenever you have that, you know, somebody's eyes light up or somebody's like, or, or their shoulders relax because they're like, see a path towards something positive. Yeah. Um, you know, that is a really good moment. Um, Conversely, sometimes, you know, people, you see people getting really, ang not angry, but really upset and nervous. But sometimes that's a good thing, too, because you're letting them know that there's something they should be concerned about that maybe they had no idea about before. You know, a lot of times when people were like, for a long time, people didn't understand. People, you know, in sea level, I mean, I had CISOs ask me, so what's the big deal when some of our credentials are being sold on Russian market or, or Genesis? And I had to go and explain to them why that was a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then you see all of a sudden things light up and it's not a good thing for them but at least you get the sense, okay, now they get the magnitude of the threat and now maybe they'll make some decisions uh, that will help them remediate that. So whenever whenever you make a change in something in the right direction, that's a good day. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I can relate to that. That's a good answer. All right, final question. Okay. What is something that took you some time to learn after moving overseas? Um, well, I still haven't quite figured out baseball. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been to a few games. I still haven't quite gotten it down yet. But uh, um, honestly, when I first came to, uh, to America, I think it was the politeness. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, and, and I, I don't want to be one of these people who's kind of like, oh, Americans are all fake. I, I, I that's not at all what I mean. But, you know, when people would stop you and be like, um, how are you? Um, and, you know, the expected is like, you know, I'm doing okay, fine, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, when somebody asked me, as you could probably tell, I like talking, I would be like, well, since you've asked – <laughs> um, and so there's this little kid, you know, telling these uh, adults, you know, uh, and, and you see, you know, after a while you start realizing, wait a second, I think I may be taking a little bit more time than, than I was meant to <laughs> in terms of this. But it took me a while to, to figure out that when somebody says, how are you, they don't literally mean how are you. It's just a p polite way of saying that they, that they care, uh, that, uh, you know, so they're, they're hoping that you're doing well. <laughs> it's not a question it's just a well wish right it's just an yes, opportunity exactly. for them to, yeah. to connect with that exactly well yeah. Roman uh, thank you so much for joining us today on the No Password or Pod podcast if our listeners want to get in touch with you um, is that okay to do and if so how can they connect with you Sure, absolutely. Um, I am very accessible. Um, I think that's one of the things I, I try to be. Um, I've had, again, not not to sound like holier than now, but I've had a lot of people uh, ping me on LinkedIn who were just breaking into the industry. And I always try to uh, chat with them because throughout my life, I've gotten a lot of help. The only reason I'm here is because a lot of good people have uh, given me a hand up. Uh, and so if I can 
never do that. So um, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn. Uh, my website is still being redone. So, uh, but you can also email me at roman at constellationcyber.net, dot net. Uh, and I do try to respond to everyone. Um, if you're selling me something, I'm probably not in your market yet. You know, I'm, I, I'm not generating, you know, a million dollars in, in uh, ARR. Uh, so you might want to hold off for a little bit. Uh, but if you have a question or you want to, uh, you know, uh, run something by me, uh, I'm uh, more than happy to, to chat. Thank you, Roman. Thank you. This is really a pleasure. Brings us to the end of the show. Uh, but first, Kaylee, what did you learn today? I learned that no matter what role you're taking in this hugely varied industry, um, staying in touch with your own humanity and a sense of gratitude um, can really take you through anything. Um, it just helps everyone involved in the process and it helps you. I don't know. It just helps everyone. It's just nice. It's a nice thing to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Roman is somebody who's doing it the right way for sure. Yeah. That's what it looks like. Um, one thing I learned is that if I'm ever called upon to board a large ship from a smaller <laughs> boat, they, step one, the hands go reverse yes. the normal rope ladder uh, technique. And two, you have the boat back up a little bit so that if you fall, you don't break your back. So there we that go. was incredible. That's exactly what I was hoping that and it, his adventures were like him. They were like that. So I'm yeah, glad he absolutely. survived it all in one piece to tell the story to us and being the position he, he is to help um, so many on the cyber front. Yep. For the entire No Password Required team, I'm Jack Clabby with Kaylee Melton. And thank you for listening. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to the No Password Required podcast. You can find us on social media at No Password Pod. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the No Password Required podcast. And if you know someone who might like it, please share it with them. The show is produced by Cyber Florida. And a special thank you goes out to our friends at Carlton Fields. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website, cyberflorida.org slash pod. All opinions expressed by the No Password Required podcast participants are their own and do not exclusively represent the views and opinions of Cyber Florida.